Thank you. I want to talk about the difference between the wise person and the cyborg. <laughs> Since more than 500 years, our modern society is driven by naive veneration of machines. We believe in the superiority of calculating rationality, and in the case of doubt, we subordinate our own intellect to the authority of machines. In our time, this might lead to serious problems. If you behave like a machine and imitate machines, you become also replaceable by a machine. About 50% of our jobs are predicted to vanish, to get lost due to new robotic technologies. Now, I don't believe in statistic predictions. I believe in change. But there is a grain of truth in this prediction. If we don't change our mind, we will become redundant. It's interesting to see that the concern about digitalization is not only raised with regard to people who will lose their job, but also with regard to people who are still in their job. We are increasingly distracted in our work by IT technologies like internet pop-up messages, uh, email messages, and according to economic calculations, about $600 billion uh, in lost productivity uh, are lost in the United States alone. This is only a calculation that focuses on the lost time. It doesn't include considerations about the lost productivity and the lost creativity that is caused by IT technologies. Now, I will give you a simple example. If you read in hyperlink text, there are a lot of areas in the brain activated, but only when you read in hypertext, the prefrontal cortex is activated. Why? Because this part of the brain is responsible for decision making. If you read in hypertext text, text that includes hypertext, we hesitate for a split second and ask ourselves, should I resume reading or should I click on the link. And this prevents us from deep reading. You know, when you read a thrilling story, you forget about yourself, you forget about the time, you get immersed in the text. This is not only more exciting, and we're not only feeling better, but this deep reading also, also opens the channel to our deep memory. Why did the church fathers knew our deep memory. Augustine called it the stomach of our mind. Because things vanish in our stomach, like when a cow eats grass, it vanishes, and when it returns, it has changed its shape. Contemporary cognitive psychology uh, provides support for this understanding, because other than in this picture, our deep memory is not a hard disk or kind of mechanic storage device. It works even when we, don't, when we are not aware of it. When the memory comes up again out of the stomach of our mind, it has been digested and we discover schematizations or complex schemes that enable us to interpret the world. I will give you a simple illustration of this phenomenon. Imagine little Lucy encountering for the first time in the zoo a roaring lion. After this exciting experience, this memory will vanish in the stomach of her deep memory. But maybe on Saturday morning, the memory will come again up when she encounters her roaring father after she has knocked over the milk jug. Milk jug. In this situation, Lucy will have a scheme to interpret the situation. For example, she will draw the conclusion that she should only knock over the milk jug when she has a cage and her father can't attack her. Or she might conclude that it is better to knock over the jug only when grandma is there because grandma works like a cage. Now, these are creative conclusions that only emerge if we pay completely our attention to one task without getting distracted in multitasking activities. 
And this is the reason why IT technologies can also undermine our intelligence. The net hampers our ability to think deeply and creatively and to find unconventional so solutions to complex tasks. That's not necessarily the case, but it is the case, case when we just follow the instructions of IT technologies because they are, after all, designed to distract our attention. They collect attention and sell it, for example, to advertising companies. Attention is the new oil of our economy, according to uh, business scholars who investigate IT technologies. We might argue, and I agree with that, uh, with Nicholas Carr at this respect, the net is making us smarter only if we define intelligence by the net's own standards. And this is the reason why we need to change our mind. And I think we need to enter a post-digital age. What is the difference between a digital age and a post-digital age? A digital age is driven by the naive veneration of digital technologies. Digital is always better. And I think we are already driven by this veneration since more than 500 years. In the post-digital age, if we learn to discern between usages of these technologies that support us and usages that assimilate our mind to the technologies of uh, machines. So we have to set limits to the virtual realities of IT technologies in order to create space for the encounter with the real world. And now I want to focus on three points that are characteristic for what I call a new realism, for a mind that is not serving the calculating rationality of machines, but remains in the driving seat. The first aspect is new realism. Since the age of Descartes, we believe in the priority of possible worlds. The scientific rationality, like in Newton, is based on the assumption that theoretical considerations about the world have to start with possible worlds. After that, we try to find a quantifiable language, a quantifiable language that enables us to translate our theories in mathematical, logical language. And in the last step, we have to make an empirical test. And these empirical tests enable us to check if it is really consistent with, with reality. And we assume that it is consistent with reality when it can be mechanically repeated, as we do in the laboratory. This is the reason why our modern understanding of science is mechanistic. And Descartes, the founder of our modern concept of, of science, was very explicit about that. I have described this Earth and indeed the whole visible universe as if it were a machine. If this idea of science and this concept of realism is true, then we are inferior to the rationality of machines and it's better to replace us by machines. But it's not true. It's not consistent with reality. And this leads me to the second point, embodiment. Here you see a depiction, again, of René Descartes, how he considered our perception of the world to work. The mind, the soul, hides behind the screen. In this case, it's not a television screen, it's just an eye. And then it can observe the world precisely as a detached observer. We have to be detached observer. My body might be part of the world, part of the big machine, but we have to have a detached observer to get an objective description of this world. Now, this is not at all consistent with the reality that we know. We are always situated when we perceive something. And modern philosophers like Maurice Merleau-Ponty confirm this observation. If I'm looking at you, I don't see my eye but I'm very well aware that my eye is also visible to you. In the same way as I know when I look at this door that it has a backside, although I can't see it at the moment. So our perception is always situated. It's always like 
touching something. When I'm touching something, I know that I'm also touched. So I'm not a detached observer. It's a mere fiction, a useful fiction, but not a realistic fiction. It's never an abstract thing. And the meanings we attribute to the world are not in my head. They are in the world. This contrasts very well, not only from our modern scientific world picture, but also from our understanding and use of IT technologies, because they are similar to the Cartesian world. We can hide behind the screen. And this is the reason why the behavior of users of IT technologies is very similar to the behavior of the mythological character of Narcissus, who was described already in the first century with the following words, he does not hear anything we say, but he's immersed eyes and ears alike in the water. We immerse in a virtual reality. And this virtual reality is very distinct from the real world that we inhabit, in which I am situated, and in which I am exposed. This example, it depicts not the Nazis of the first century, but the Nazis of the 21st century. It's easier to engage with your mobile phone than with this person at the other side of the bench. Because if you engage with a real person, you are exposed. And this might become embarrassing because you are no longer in control about yourself. Things have a power to attract our attention and to get us out of control. For example, if a person is in the room, I'm moving differently than when I'm alone because this person has to, by its mere presence, a power of attraction. And this makes me aware of myself, makes me aware that I'm exposed. The easier way to escape this is to immerse in a virtual reality or to engage with your mobile phone. Why? It's very simple. You can control everything in your mobile phone. You can control how you want to look like when you set up a Facebook message or a Facebook picture. In the case of doubt, you can disconnect or you can uh, cancel a friendship and find a new one. The internet is a space of infinite possibilities and you are never posited. That's the advantage, but that's also the drawback. In virtual realities, we are more in the situation of Descartes' soul. We are detached observers and we can control which input we will give into the world. By contrast, a child knows what it means to be. What does it mean to be? When I'm existing in this space, I immediately respond to my environment. If this is little Paul, little Paul doesn't need to think a split of a second how he will respond to the smile of her mother. He just smiles back. And this makes him realize what it means to exist. That's very different from the situation of IT technologies, although they have also a certain kind of interactivity. The interactivity of IT technologies is the interactivity between someone that can hide behind the screen and someone who receives a message at the other end. It's not simultaneous, and this means you can always control what you do, but you're never exposed and you're never posited. And when you are not posited, when you're not able to respond to your environment spontaneously, <coughs> your deep memory will not be activated. Your creativity is hampered. So there is an advantage of IT communication. It's, as it were, the shortest way to enjoy yourself without taking the risk of getting involved with the real world in which you are exposed. But we are feeling bored whenever we return to the real world that we inhabit as vulnerable embodied persons. Why do we feel bored? Because as Seneca already observed in the first century, to be everywhere is to be nowhere. To be in the web is to be in an unlimited space. I can be everywhere. And every, everything 
can be equally exciting and equally boring. At the end, everything is exchangeable. So this leads me to my last point. How, to, how can we recover our trust in the analogical rationality of our human mind? Not to pull the plug. We don't need to get rid of IT technologies. But we have to develop an awareness of the difference between the rationality of machines and the rationalities of a human person, of the difference between a cyborg and between a wise person. And I think the key to a change of mind is spirituality. Spiritual practices enables us to be silent, just to be here, just to be present without thinking about possibilities, about what might happen in the next moment or what might have happened yesterday, just being there. By contrast, people who have grown up with IT technologies are feeling frequently anxious and frightened of silent spaces. You feel disconnected. And this encourages us to take the, most, the shortest escape route, to escape into inane conversations. Like in this situation, we are feeling embarrassed because no one is talking about something. The escape route is to turn on your mobile phone. This phenomenon is not as new as we might expect it to be. It was already known by the Desert Fathers of early Christianity. Here you see a depiction of Saint Anthony, the most famous uh, Desert Father of antiquity. He knew the experience that silent spaces, the desert, are frightening. And he knew the temptation by virtual spaces, the temptation to escape in a fantasy world. He was not accidentally a specialist on demons. Demons are fantasy worlds in which we can escape. They prevent us from being present. But Anthony knew that the escape into fantasy worlds cannot cure us from our anxiety. The only way to overcome the anxiety is to face it, to become relaxed in the presence of silence, to become relaxed in the presence of the divine light that's everywhere in my embodied world. It's depicted here as at the top of this painting. So he was dragged down by the demons to the ground, but he didn't try to escape. He waited. He became silent. He became a contemplative person. Silence releases us from the temptation to escape into the world's of inane conversation. No one is free who has to look up messages every 15 minutes, according to statistical analysis. We are looking up SMS messages every 15 minutes. Someone who is forced to do that is no longer free. How can we get free of that? We have to recover our ability just to be there. And we have to stop to play rules or to create images of myself. Images that present to other people how I want to be seen by others. What could have happened in the future is then the main interest of our thinking. Or what might have happened in the past, what I could do better. The escape route is not to escape in virtual realities. It's to learn to be present, to learn to be in the silent space of the present time. And this silence releases creative responses to our environment because it enables us to be focused on one thing. That's what you learn in every spiritual practice, to be focused on one thing, just to be present. Contemplative practices restore our, our intuitive capacity to be responsive to our environment and to reconcile this possibility with the responsibilities of grown-ups. That's why I think we have to enter the post-digital age. We have to recover the virtues that distinguish us from machines, and we have to learn to distinguish 
between forces that support and some forces that suppress the flourishing of our mind. Thank you.